So if you keep making pottery, eventually you have to fire some of it. And that's kind of where I am today. I've been making pottery for weeks and months, but I really haven't been out here in the wild to fire any pottery in quite a while. So today I've driven out here to public lands in order to fire a bunch of pottery that I have. As I'm doing that, I'm gonna show you how to successfully fire greenware pottery in a pit. There's a lot of skepticism online these days about pit firing greenware pottery. A lot of the advice is you need to bisque it first. But in my opinion, once it's bisque, you're not really firing it, you're just coloring it, right? You're just giving it a little charcoal or chemical colorants on it. The actual firing is turning mud into ceramics. And that's what we're doing here today. These are not bisque ware, these are just dried mud that I'm gonna be firing in a pit in the ground. And so, in the course of this video, I will show you all the little tricks, the ins and outs, to actually successfully pit firing greenware pottery. Let's get started. Naomi in Australia asked me about the materials that I bring when I go firing and kind of getting ready. You know, how do I make sure I have all the things I need? It's really not that hard because I keep all of these things together. So in my workshop, I keep the gloves, the lighter, and the infrared thermometer all in one place. I can just grab them and go. Uh, this is a water jug that I keep in my truck at all times because I live in the desert in case I break down somewhere, I have water to drink. Uh, I don't always bring an ax. A lot of the fuel I use is small enough that I can break it over my knee or under my foot. So this is an optional item. Shovel, very important. I have forgotten the shovel on occasion and I can make do without it, but it's very useful. Uh, cover shirts. So this is an old milk crate that I use to keep my cover shirts in. And sometimes I forget it, sometimes I don't use it. So when I'm firing Salado polychromes, I don't use cover shirts at all. And in that case, it's not even something I bring. And here's how I pack the pots when I travel. So I just put them on the floor of the truck, packed in around blankets so that they don't roll and bump into each other. Always clear all burnable material in a wide area around your firing location. One thing you don't want to do is start a wildfire. So let's talk a little bit about the pit. I see people dig these firing pits pretty deep and really what you need to keep in mind is that one of the critical elements in a fire is oxygen. So the fire needs three things to survive. Heat, fuel, and oxygen. You put that fire in the bottom of a deep pit, it's gonna have trouble breathing. You load a bunch of pots in there and then stack wood around it, you're really gonna have trouble breathing. Not only is the fire not gonna get as hot as it would otherwise, but the pots aren't gonna oxidize well either. They're gonna come out all black and they're not gonna get as hot as they would otherwise. So in pit firing, the first thing to remember is you're striking a balance between smothering this fire and putting these pots down in the insulating ground. So the ground is helpful in that it blocks the wind, it kind of holds the heat better than the air itself, but at the same time, there's not as much oxygen down there. So the best thing to remember is, you don't want that pit any deeper than the height of the pots. So at this stage, I'm just preheating the pottery. This is called a primary fire, and so it's doing a couple of things. First of all, it's building a bed of coals that's gonna be the foundation of our firing. Second of all, it's heating the pit. So the earthen walls of the pit itself are warming up. And that's important because the earth is a massive heat sink. And so the higher you can get that earth heated, uh, the less it's gonna suck heat away from your fire once you get started. And then the other thing we're doing is we're preheating the pots. By heating it up, you're just driving out that remaining moisture. Moisture is the number one cause of breakage in a firing like this. So you wanna make sure you heat them up really good. And so as the pots sit here in heat, I will rotate them. As they get hot on one side, I'll turn them so they get hot all the way around. Make sure you heat the bottoms and the tops as well as all the sides really good to make sure you get all that moisture out. You do that real good and your chances of surviving go up like 80% above what they would be otherwise. The other thing about moisture is it's really helpful for that moisture to be able to escape the pot when it wants to. To ease that moisture escaping the pot body without breaking it, temper in the clay is very important. So pots that are gonna be fired like this should have a good amount of temper or grog added to the clay body. Even if you're using a commercial clay, add a little extra grog or temper to that clay just to help that moisture kind of get out of it when it needs to without blowing off a piece of the pot. The clay in these pots is all tempered with about 20% sand by volume. So now my fire has burned to coals, my pots have preheated, I'm ready to get started stacking 
the pottery first over the fire on top of those stones I have there, and then the fuel will be stacked over the pottery carefully. The important tip to give you at this stage is airspace. Airspace is critical. The tighter you stack this firing, the less hot the pots are gonna get. The tighter you stack it, the less oxidized those pots are gonna get. We want them to oxidize. We don't want a bunch of carbon on the clay body surface, or at least I don't. I want them to come out nice and clean and bright, and that means airspace. Airspace around the pottery, airspace between the pots themselves. If you're enjoying this kind of content, think about becoming a channel member. For just a couple bucks a month, you can help me buy things I need like new camera equipment and gasoline to come out here in places like this and film. Just click that little join button down below. I also release exclusive videos for channel members every month. So if you're interested in any of that, and if you're interested in helping me out to make these kind of videos, just click that join button, thanks. This is called the secondary fire. So the primary fire was just building that bed of coals, preheating the pottery. The secondary fire is actually what fires the pottery, what turns the clay into ceramics. And so we're hoping to reach temperatures of around 8, 850 degrees Celsius in this firing. I've got my infrared temperature gun and I'm gonna be checking it as we get towards the end. If we don't get up to temp, I've got some extra wood I'm gonna throw on it, hopefully kind of bump those temps up to where I want them. But at this point, mostly it's just sitting back and letting it burn and hoping it goes okay. You can listen for pops at this point and you can hear if some of those pots start cracking because if they break, it'll be in the early part of the firing as the fire is coming up in temperature. 750 on that coverture there, 790, 770. My secondary fire is starting to burn down to coals, and this is exactly what I want it to do. So you see the way I stacked the wood over the pottery, it was kind of leaning against itself, so that as it burns to coals, those coals fall down on top of those cover sherds and on top of the pottery and just kind of form a little oven, holding that heat in there, allowing it to have a nice, good oxidizing soak at the end there. Hopefully we'll get it oxidized real good in there. And then at this stage, the temperature's coming down, but it's coming down very slowly. I just hit it, and it's right about 720 to 750. So even though it's burning the coals, it's holding heat in there real good. So the whole advantage of a pit fire is you've got the ground kind of holding heat in there. If you can form a little oven out of the coals on top, you can kind of cook that pottery for a while. And so that's where it'll sit for maybe a half hour or so and let that coal start burning down to ashes before I start pulling them away and opening it up, see how the pottery is inside, all right? These reds look really dark right now, but they're still oxidizing. And so as they cool, they'll actually brighten up and get redder and redder. Always take the time to make sure you put your fire out real good. Are you ready for the big reveal? Okay, here they are. After they've had a chance to cool down, those colors have oxidized and they really pop. This was a really successful firing. All the pots ring really good. The colors are nice and bright. There are a couple places on the bowl where it reduced a little bit or maybe didn't oxidize quite as strongly as I'd have liked. You can see that where it's cherry red in some places and kind of gradiates towards yellow or pink in others. That would have been helped by better airflow around it. It was just packed in there a little too tight down in that pit. 
Which is why, when I'm trying to oxidize polychrome, I like to fire on the surface of the ground a lot of times. Although I don't get the protection of the earth kind of holding heat in and protecting me from the breeze, uh, I can get a little more oxygen to the pots and oxidize them a little more strongly. I just may have to be a little more careful with how I stack the fuel and the size of fuel that I use. So there's pros and cons for surface and pit firing. But I didn't break anything, everything came out really good. And, and this is a great way to fire your pottery outdoors, especially if you're just getting started and you're kind of afraid of breaking things. There's much less risk of breaking pottery in a pit fire like this than there is on the surface or some of the other ways. So go out there and give this a shot. If you saw the way I measured temperature with that infrared gun, I actually have another way I measure temperature with a thermocouple in these outdoor firings. If you're interested in doing these kind of firings, you probably want to learn more about how best to measure temperature, because it's good to know where you're at, where your high temperatures are, and whether or not you need to bump those up. So I made a video about measuring temperatures in firings, and I'll put the link to that right over here. So go check that out, learn about how to measure the temperatures before you get started. All right, thanks for coming along with me today. Catch you next time.